key hacking will make you famous. Or is it infamous? I mix those up sometimes. Kidding aside, this video is part of a series of videos on p-hacking, what it is, and why it's so dangerous for science. I give a pretty detailed high-level explanation of p-hacking in the first video in this series, so if you're not familiar with the idea, please have a look there first. I'll put a link to that below. But in a few seconds, researchers are motivated to get what's called a p-value to be below a threshold of 0.05. If they do that, their findings are considered meaningful and they can typically publish their results. If they don't, well, all their work is largely wasted. And to get those p-values below 0.05, there are some very dubious and unethical approaches they can take. In this video, we'll dig into one of those unethical approaches that researchers can use to p-hack their data by collecting multiple measures and only reporting those that work. Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and today we'll dig deeper into p-hacking so that you can understand how to spot it when you see research results and avoid it when you do the research yourself. The goal here is to build intuition, so we'll avoid heavy-duty math and statistics and focus on what you really need to know. To help us out with this, we're going to imagine a simple research study that compares two different shipping warehouses run by two different managers. Each manager has a slightly different philosophy about how to run their warehouse. Sue prefers a stricter approach, where if anyone slips up, they get scolded. And Bill prefers a more gentle approach, where if anyone slips up, they get a small pat on the back and are simply asked to try harder next time. The leadership of this company wants to know which approach, Sue's or Bill's, is more effective, and so they hire a consultant to do some research for them. Simple enough. Okay, quick aside. Yes, I know that this isn't a great study because about a thousand things could differ across warehouses, but for the sake of this example, let's just assume that's not an issue here. Anyway, the research consultants suggest that Sue and Bill should run their warehouses however they like for a few months, and then they will report back to leadership which management approach is better. So a few months go by, and the consultants look to see if the two warehouses differ on these five metrics here. What they find is that Sue's strict approach results in slightly fewer shipping errors and not much else. Critically, they run a statistical test to compare shipping error rates across the two warehouses, and they find that this difference where Sue's approach does better is statistically significant at the standard 0.05 level. And by the way, if you're not too familiar with statistical significance, I do have a video that covers the intuition of it, which I'll make sure to link to below. Anyway. The consulting company reports back to leadership that Sue's approach is most effective, but when doing so, they exclusively focus on the difference in shipping errors and largely ignore the other metrics that they measured. They point to the fact that the p-value for the shipping error metrics is 0.05, which, as everyone agrees, is statistically significant. Leadership is thrilled since they now know how to instruct their warehouse managers to behave. Now, if you watch this other video on p-hacking, this should seem very familiar. There, we talked about how testing a prediction across multiple conditions without explicitly specifying which one is the key one to test greatly increases how likely an observed result is to be a false positive. Well, this is a very similar situation here. The consultants in this example did not say that they were only interested in shipping error rates. Rather, they measured a bunch of things, and then, after seeing that one of them exhibited a difference, decided that was the one that was key to report. But the problem isn't the lack of reporting. I mean, if they hit the other results, that's not great, but that's not necessary for them to be engaging in p-hacking. The p-hacking here is in not pre-specifying which metric would be key to their ultimate findings. If they started their consulting work by saying that the only thing they will focus on is shipping error rates, they could collect a hundred other measures, find whatever results, and there wouldn't be any issue. The issue is that they were picking a metric after they know that it worked. As in, after they saw that there was a statistically significant difference across warehouses in terms of shipping error rates. Let me make this crystal clear. Here are the metrics they measured, and here are the results. But I'm going to blur the results out for a few seconds. If they first said, we only care about shipping errors, and then unblurred the data, and found a difference in shipping errors, so all is fine. But if they didn't pre-specify anything, unblurred the results, and then to their surprise, found that shipping errors are different, well now they're p-hacking. And yes, I realize how incredibly counterintuitive this is. The metrics are the same, the results are the same, and yet just by failing to specify what they plan to focus on, they are p-hacking and just might be seeing a false positive result. But before we get to the intuition of why that's true, 
If you could take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content I put out, I'd really appreciate it. With that said, let's dig into the intuition behind this form of p-hacking. To help us understand why the consultant's behavior is so problematic, let's imagine a game where there is a secret number between 1 and 20, and then I have to guess it. And let's also play five rounds of that game. The rules of the game are simple. Before the secret numbers are revealed, I have to pick one of my guesses to count. It won't matter if I get the other ones right. All that matters is the one that I pick to count. If I get that one right, I win the game. If I get different ones right, and my chosen round guess wrong, well, tough luck for me. So the odds of me winning this game are exactly 1 in 20, or 5%. I get that because I first pick a round, and we see that my odds in that round are exactly 1 in 20, which is just 5%. But what if I change the rules and say that I don't have to pick one of the rounds in advance? Instead, if I get any of my picks right, well then I win. Now the odds of me winning change a lot. The odds of me getting any guess right actually jump to 22.6%. Quick aside, the calculations for that is in my video description. Anyway, in other words, just by dumb luck, I'm going to win this new game 22.6% of the time. If only one guess that I pre-specify counts, the odds that I'm going to win are 5%. If I make five guesses, and the rule are that any correct guess is a win, well, I'm going to win 22.6% of the time. And to be clear, I win by complete and total luck. There is no skill here whatsoever. And this is exactly what's happening with the research consultants. If they get one chance at finding a significant result, the odds that that result is a false positive are about 5%. That's roughly what we mean when we say that a statistically significant result needs a p-value of 0.05 or less to be considered meaningful. In other words, just by dumb luck, 5% of the time, they might find a statistically significant result that has nothing to do with reality. But if they get to consider any difference across their five metrics, the likelihood of a false positive jumps dramatically, to about 22.6%. Again, that is with just dumb luck. As in, we expect a false positive around 23% of the time because we're getting five chances at being right. In focusing on just the one shipping error metric, the consultants are claiming that they are playing the version of the guessing game where you have to pick which round counts first, but in reality, they are playing the version of the game where any correct pick is a win. And remember, in that latter version, the likelihood that they win, by complete chance, is a whopping 22.6%. If we swap out winning a guessing game with observing a false positive, you hopefully now see just how bad this form of p-hacking is. And remember, the consultants are claiming that there's a difference across warehouses in terms of shipping error rates and that they are pretty confident, statistically significantly confident, that that difference is meaningful. And they are basing that on a p-value being 0.05 or less. But the problem is that that p-value is only a reflection of statistical confidence if shipping error rates were the only metric that would result in them feeling like they learned something about these warehouses. In reality, if any of the metrics showed a difference, they'd report roughly the same thing to leadership that differing management styles matter. And because they didn't pre-specify a single metric to consider before seeing their results, they are engaging in some serious p-hacking. They are misrepresenting how likely their result is to be a false positive and thus have nothing to do with reality. This practice of deciding which metric is the important one after seeing the results from a bunch of different metrics is a classic example of p-hacking and one that appears relatively innocuous, but is actually a complete disaster if our goal is to actually learn something useful from our data. Thankfully, there are ways to fix this problem by doing something like a Bonferroni correction, which is a topic for another video. But if you are a less than ethical researcher, you could easily conclude that something is real when in fact, you're just p-hacking your way to fame. I hope you now understand a bit better this one form of p-hacking, not reporting all measures collected and analyzed. In the other videos in this series, I cover three other forms of p-hacking, as well as a tool that can be used to detect p-hacking in published work. And if there's a form of p-hacking that you want to share with me that I'm not covering, please leave a comment below, and I'll make sure to keep the conversation going. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.